you'll turn to Esther chapter 7 and 8, Esther chapter 7 and 8, in case this is your first week or first week in a while, let me catch you up on the, on the story through a series of verses, this is on your app as well, you can download the Multiply Family app, choose your church location, that would be Concord, and that, the notes are always on there, you can follow along. Esther 2.15 says, now Esther carried favor in the eyes of all who saw her. We've been talking about that Esther didn't have to fight for favor. She already carried favor. That word favor is, is charis. It's the same word as grace. You carry, you already carry a grace in your life. You carry a favor in your life. In Esther 4.14, though, um, uh, this is the response to Esther when she became queen, when she began to step out and walk in that favor that immediately a plot was formed by Haman, uh, one of the king's advisors, to kill Mordecai, her adopted father, and all of the, all of the Jews. And so Mordecai says to Esther in Esther 4.14, Esther, you cannot remain silent at a time like this. And he goes on to say, for who knows, who knows that you have been placed in the kingdom and been made queen for such a time as this. And Esther said, you know, you're right. I can't be queen and then have people that are suffering around me. So she says, if I perish, I perish. Because if she went in to see the king and the king did not uh, raise the golden scepter, then she could have lost her life. And she said, I'm not going to live comfortably. Come on. I'm not going to live in a bubble. She said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not just going to come to church for me. I was made for more than this. She said, the favor that I carry in my life isn't, so, isn't just so I can feel good. Can I preach this this morning? The favor and the blessing of God is just not for goosebumps in my life. She says, if I perish, I perish. I'm going I'm to do something. I'm going to do something. But then you have on the other side, Esther 5.14 her declaration did not stop the work of the enemy. Haman said, because somebody said, hey, why don't you build a gallows and go ahead and hang Mordecai on this gallows? So it says the idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So Esther now risks everything. She goes in to see the king, and fortunately the king holds out the golden scepter. He says, what do you want, my queen? Anything up to half the kingdom. She said, I want to have a banquet, and I want to invite the king and Haman to the banquet. And so they have a banquet, and again, the king says, what do you want, my queen, up to half the kingdom? She says, I want to have another banquet. And she says, I want the king and Haman to come to that banquet. So we pick up the story in Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. On this second occasion, while they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, tell me what you want. Third time, Queen Esther, what is your request? I will give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Queen Esther replied, if I have found favor with the king and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life, remember the king did not know that she was Mordecai's adopted daughter. The king did not know of her Jewish heritage. She says, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared for my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial of a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? And Esther replied, this guy. This wicked Haman is our adversary. She says, our I didn't see that word until just now. But can I preach to somebody? If somebody is fighting against you, they're not just fighting against you. Say our. If, some, if the devil's fighting against you, he's fighting against God. It's an unfair battle. Somebody, you are not in that battle alone. It's an hour. Say it again. Say our. Our. Esther's like, we have a problem. We have our adversary, this wicked Haman, our enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Say, uh-oh. 
the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. I put some things on your notes that I feel like God wants to tell you and remind you of this morning. Number one is this. When you follow favor in your life, number one, the weapon that was meant for your destruction will be used to destroy the enemy. Esther chapter 7 verse 9. Moreover, the gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai, the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. How many of you know that some verses of scripture preach themselves? The enemy, the gallows, the weapon that was formed, the weapon that the enemy formed and fashioned to destroy your family, when God steps into the picture, that weapon is not only canceled, it is turned back against the enemy. The gallows that had been built to take down your health, when God steps into the picture, the gallows is not only defeated, but the weapon is turn back on the enemy but then I realized something about the gallows in and of themselves I don't know if anybody read or read ahead in this story but it said the gallows was anybody know how tall these gallows were 70 yeah 75 feet 75 seven and a half stories can you say unnecessary I've not done a lot of study in the art of torture, but I would think that for a gallows simply to do the job of a gallows, it would only have to be what? Seven? Eight? Let's shoot for the stars here if lumber prices are really low and say 10 feet. But Haman had the gallows built 75 feet because here's what I know about the devil is that he doesn't want to just destroy you. He wants to use fear and intimidation in your life. He wants to build a gallows so high that it's not just going to hang your head. It's hanging over your head. How many of you can I preach this to somebody that the devil's doing something in your life that it's hanging over your head and And even when you have moments of victory, because Mordecai is being paraded down the street in victory. But I wonder if Mordecai, out of the corner of his eye, catches a gallows that was built and that gallows is hanging over his head. I wonder if when he got the news that the scepter had been extended to Esther, part of him wanted to praise, but part of him had an eye on the gallows. Is this resonating with anybody today? Have you ever had a moment during worship that you're lifting up and you're singing about the glory and the victory and the power of God, but you know in the back of your mind that you got a gallows that's hanging over your head you got an enemy that's saying I'm coming for your family I'm coming for your health I'm coming for your job I'm coming for can I preach a little bit about the gallows today that's hanging over your head that the enemy is using that gallows not just to prophesy your destruction but to get you to walk in fear and intimidation so you run away from the very thing because the enemy knows that the gallows was built for his destruction so he's gonna try to scare you away is this making sense to anybody today then here's the other thing I've thought about the gallows what if what if the gallows were actually good what if the gallows were good why Who's the enemy in this story? Haman. What were the gallows? That was the, that was the symptom. Does this make sense? The gallows weren't the enemy. The gallows were the outward symptom of the root. Can I preach a little bit about the difference between symptoms and the root? And I wonder if it had not been 
for the pain of the gallows. The pain, sometimes, can I preach that sometimes the pain is not the problem? That the pain points you to the problem. And if you think that the pain is the problem, then you can spend all of your life dealing with the symptoms of the problem and blaming this person and blaming that person and blaming your past and blaming your teacher when you never have dealt with the root of the problem. But when pain comes in your life, it's not for your destruction. It's so you can finally confront the problem head on and deal with Haman in your life. Haman's going down in your life. You're not dealing with the symptoms anymore. You're going to deal with the root. When now? Today. You're going to deal with that root now. Haman is out of your life. He's gone out of your life. There are wonderful doctors. There are wonderful nurses. There are wonderful hospitals. But can I talk a little bit about in some areas a healthcare system that is built around an industry that doesn't want to solve the root of the problem. They just want to get they just want to get you to deal with the symptoms so you become a slave to the system. Can I preach about an enemy of your soul that just wants to get you so distracted that you never deal with the root of the problem, the root of bitterness, the root of anger, the root of the lust. It's time to deal with the root. Haman, you're going down on your own gallows today. No longer are we just going to deal with these symptoms. You gotta feel you sometimes you have to feel pain yes, so you wake up Come on. Come on. and you say, I don't want to experience that pain, but I'm gonna take it to the altar and I'm gonna do business with God and we're gonna deal with this Haman in my life. Jesus. Number two, when you follow the favor, you will receive an increase of property and power that you would not have otherwise received. Esther chapter 8. On that day, King Xerxes gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, and Mordecai came before the king. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. So here you have the house of Haman, that's property, and you have the signet ring, which is power. But I started thinking that, you know, sometimes in our lives, we'll pray for an increase. God, give me an increase of power or give me an increase of property. But then we don't want to walk through the things that Esther and Mordecai walked through to get the increase in our, in our lives. And so, but like, then I, then I looked at this and I said this. Okay, Haman was the enemy. He's killed. The gallows, they're gone like, after verse 2 of Esther chapter 8, hard, like, hard stop here, right? And, and roll the credits. End of the movie. Y'all, Esther, Esther won. Yes? She got, she, got every, she got everything she asked for and more because that's the kind of God we serve. That he blesses us beyond and he blesses uh, glory to glory and he leads. Esther got everything she wanted. Like, why have a chapter 9? Why, cha why have a chapter 10? Why did, and, and I wondered now, like, okay, when Esther got everything that she wanted out of life, what was her response? Here was her response. Here's verse 3. Then... Esther spoke to the king, and she fell at his feet and, and did what? Esther, do you, did you misread the situation? Esther, your prayers were answered. Esther, you're not going to die. Esther, Haman is dead. How does Esther respond to the blessing in her life? She fell at his feet and wept. And pleaded with the king to avert the evil plan of Haman and the plot he had devised against the Jews. In other words, Esther said, 
I'm blessed. But if I'm blessed and everybody else dies, then it's not going to be worth it. I wonder about somebody when you get saved, you take a moment and say, thank you, Jesus. But we're not done yet because I got friends and I got family and I got neighbors and I got relatives that they're still living under that death sentence. And I'm not done when I receive my blessing. That's just the starting place. Can I throw out that it's what you do after the prayer is answered that says everything about who you are as a person? What do I do with this blessing? What do I do with all of this property? I'm blessed and highly favored. Yes, but we are. My favorite line, I think, in all of our giving declarations is I'm blessed to be a blessing can you say that together i'm blessed to be a blessing that's what that ministry fair is all about that's what it's all about i'm not just blessed to come and receive and believe me i know how the devil will lie to you on a day like this he'll start talking about all your weaknesses and you got somewhere to be and all of your flaws and shortcomings, and I mentioned it before, but ah, oh, it's a bigger church. They got plenty of people. No, God, God needs you. You have a favor on your life. You have a grace upon your life. And those tater tots out there <laughs> are some of the best things on the planet. <laughs> so take two, but leave some for the 1115 service. But as you're eating that, can you just ask God, God, how can I be blessed to be a blessing? How can I serve at Multiply Church? We say it like this. Everyone has a next step. We all do. Why? Because that keeps us moving. Moving from what? From life to family to freedom to purpose. Hey, isn't that Esther's story? Isn't that Esther's story? Esther found life, and then she found family. She wasn't left as an orphan. God gave her Mordecai. And then she found freedom. Her life was spared in verse 2. But in verse 3, she finds her purpose. She may have thought that becoming queen was her purpose. That wasn't her purpose. The purpose was... I got the spirit of Pastor Manny coming on me. (laughs) I I can't get it quite like he does, but... The, fa- the, fa- the favor wasn't just for verse 2. A lot of Christians stop at verse 2. Oh, I got it. I received. No, the favor was for verse 3. Sometimes the favor is to weep. Sometimes the favor is to stand in the gap. Sometimes the favor is to forgive people that do not deserve to be forgiven. Sometimes the favor is to step on airplanes and go into the other countries and reach people for Jesus. Sometimes favor is to walk across the street and tell your neighbor. Sometimes favor is getting in a truck and going to the mountains. Sometimes favor is about giving to kingdom builders. Sometimes favor is being a youth leader on a Wednesday night when you don't have to be sometimes favor is greeting somebody in the parking lot that needed a smile on a Sunday that's what the favor is for in your life the favor is for others number three when you follow the favor you move from the first decree to the second decree okay so here's the first decree let's Rewind just a little bit in case you forgot. We're going to read this in Esther 3, 13. It says, dispatches were sent by couriers to all of the king's provinces with the order to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day. And then it names the day, the 13th day of the 12th month in the month of Adar and to plunder their goods. That was the first decree, okay? So now you're a Jew in the city of Susa, and every Jew knew this decree, and the decree was hanging over their head because they saw the gallows too. And not just, would you like to know the day of your death? I would not. 
Maybe some people, I would, but they, like the, they probably didn't circle it on the calendar, but can you imagine that? Every Jew knew that their days were numbered. And they looked at their little three-year-old and they said, I got to celebrate their third birthday party. But then they didn't tell the kid, but, but I bet like when they're, when they're having the dessert and then they turn and wiping a tear out of their eye and thinking he's not going to make it to four. He doesn't even know, but he's not going to make it to four. And they're looking at their daughter and saying, I'm never going to get to walk my daughter down the aisle. And they're, they're looking and they're, they've heard the stories about getting to return someday to the promised land and get to go back to the houses of their ancestors. And they knew the promise, but the day of destruction, it was marked on the calendar and those 75 foot gallows are not just hanging over Mordecai's head it's hanging over the Jews head and that's the first decree but Esther went in and the favor had been extended and now there is a second decree y'all there's a second decree so you better believe that every Jew, every Jew is listening to the radio has the television they're scrolling they're like what read us now this second decree so here we go Esther chapter 8 and the king's scribes were summoned and a new decree was written. Y'all know they were having church that day. They were, sh they were shouting this, to, come on, write that new decree. To each province in its own script and to each people in its own. Yeah, write it, King, in every language. We want everybody to know every language. Come on, King. I mean, in verse 10, and he wrote it in the name of the King, in the name of the King, and sealed it with the King's signet ring. Seal it, King. I mean, they're preaching, right? They are, they are in this on a Sunday morning. And he sent the letters mounted by couriers riding on swift horses. Send those Amazon trucks, King. Come on to every house. Send them out verse 11 saying that the king allowed allow it king allowed the jews who were in every city every city to gather and defend their lives what that's the decree the decree is i have to fight mordecai look at your signet ring you could have decreed, hello, anybody with me? Mordecai, you could have decreed that the fight was canceled. Esther, we love you. You're our queen. You have favor. But Esther, did you ever think to maybe decree to call off the fight? The decree was that they got to fight? I started thinking about the craziness of that decree, but then I started thinking about this in our lives, that sometimes, 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 sometimes we have to realize that we are not blessed to bypass the battle, that we're blessed for the battle. I started to think about sometimes in our lives, I'm not built to bypass the battle. I'm built for the battle. Say, I'm blessed for the battle. Say, I'm built for the battle. Tell your neighbor, you're built for the battle. Because when you look back at the first decree, and the first decree said, you are dead. The first decree said, you're a sinner. The first decree said, you're going to hell. The first decree said, you don't have a chance. When you get a second decree that says, I get to live to fight another day. I get to live to try. I get to live to fight. Can I preach to somebody? You are not fat for. You are built for the battle you're not built to sit on the sidelines you're not built to avoid the battle and that's why when things come at you and that battle is coming at you you say devil i'm built for this battle i'm blessed for this battle the favor that's on my life is for this battle and so i will rise up and fight in the name of the lord i got a weapon that is the sword of god upon my life i'm blessed for this battle I'm blessed for this battle. And then I started wondering, is the word of God not crazy, y'all? Let's just read, read it. Read it for yourself. And then I started wondering this. How are the people of Israel going to react when they hear this news? Are they going to be mad at Mordecai? 
Are they going to feel like Esther? You got stuff in your life that we didn't. Are they going to be? Are they going to feel entitled? Are they going to be angry? And then it says, it says, this is how the Jewish people reacted in verse 15. It said, and the people of Susa, they did what? Hey, hey, Jewish people, that date that you had marked on your calendar that was your certain destruction, you still, you still have to fight. And the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. And they were filled with joy and gladness. And they were honored everywhere in every province and city. Where, wherever the king's decree arrived, they rejoice. Can I remind somebody today? that you don't have to wait for the end of the battle to start celebrating. You don't have to wait for the end of the battle to have joy in your life. When can you have, when can you have joy? When the decree comes. When I get a word, that's when I start celebrating because if the king said it, it's as good as done. So I'm not going to wait, devil, till every battle is out of my life to start praising him. I'm going to praise you now because I got a word within me that is a word of victory, a word of health, a word of healing, a word of celebration that I am more than a conqueror. And so it only takes a word. And everybody around you, looking at you like you're crazy how are you celebrating in the middle of the battle because i got a word i got a word i don't live by what i see i live by the decree i don't live by what's going on around me i live by the decree i live by the word that's spoken over me that's what my joy is connected to that's what my peace is connected to it's connected to my word I want to remind you that in the book of Esther, remember we talked about this the first week. If I can preach like this at 50, y'all can, y'all can respond good too, huh? Yes, sir. That, that in the book of Esther, remember this uh, Bible trivia? It's the only book in the Bible, on, only book in the Bible that doesn't mention the name of God or the name of Jesus. But Jesus is all through it. I feel like God wants to remind somebody this morning who feels like, I don't know, God, where are you? I can't see you. I can't feel you. God says he's all over it. He's all over it. He's working. He's weaving a thread of favor. He's weaving a thread of favor through the fabric of your life, even when, you do, even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, even when the gallows is hanging over my head, the web, the web of, of favor is still being woven. And it's pointing to something greater. It's pointing to something great, greater. The first decree was made. It was a death sentence. The decree couldn't be taken away. The decree had to be fulfilled. And in the fulfillment of the decree, there would be issued a new decree. The new decree was delivered, and this decree was born in obscurity. In a stable in Bethlehem. This new decree was the word becoming flesh. Oh, but the enemy wasn't going to take this lying down. He incited a group with the Haman spirit out of envy and jealousy to come up with lies. There was a trial at night. People lied, accusing this man of blasphemy. A weapon was formed. It was a weapon reserved for the worst of criminals, the lowest of the low. These gallows were in the shape of a cross. 
after being beaten and mocked, he was forced to carry this weapon up a hill. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. Nails were driven into his hands and feet. And upon that weapon, he breathed his last. The fullness of the weight of the old decree was upon his shoulders. A decree of sin and death. A decree of lies and lostness. A decree of chaos and confusion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the king had not forsaken him. The scepter was extended. The offer was made. And it wasn't up to half the kingdom. It was the whole kingdom. All of heaven, all of earth, and above the earth, and under the earth, all of the kingdom was his. Three days passed. His followers came to the tomb. He wasn't there. It was empty. But what happened to the weapon? What happened to the weapon? Oh, that? It was meant for evil, but God used it for good. What the enemy formed to destroy God's people was used to destroy the enemy. But what about the signet ring? The king had taken that back too. Now he had the keys of death and hell and the grave. But what about the old decree? It was a abolished and there was a new decree in the land a decree of salvation a decree of life a decree of joy a decree of peace i wonder if somebody could stand to your feet this morning and say god thank you with heads bowed and eyes closed before we eat some fair food and say, God, how do you want to use me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, you are every person in this room, every man, woman, and child in this room. You are living under one of two decrees. You are either living under the decree of sin and death or by the blood of Jesus, you are living under the new decree of life and life everlasting with heads bowed eyes closed there are some in this room that would say pastor i have not moved from the first decree to the second decree and i want to do that right here right now i don't want to live under the decree of death under the decree of guilt under the decree of shame under the decree of all that old stuff i want a new decree to be spoken over my life and so on the count of three i'm gonna ask that you lift your hand high and unashamedly say I want to live under the decree of Jesus in my life one I'm done with the old decree two it's a new day in my life three come on lift your hand high I got you I got you I got you who else I got a new decree I got a new decree today I got a new decree today church family open your eyes let's pray this together say Jesus I come to the cross and I ask you to forgive me. Remove my sin. Remove my guilt. Come into my heart. Come into my life. And help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I bless you with a new word. I bless you with a new word. I bless you with a decree of peace. I bless you with a decree of life. I bless you with a decree of Jesus Christ over you and your household. Go and walk in that decree today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, I hope the service made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we would love to know. All you have to do is download the app and click Next Steps. We have resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey in following Him. Hey, all my fam, just wanted to let you know, you can be a part of supporting the needs in Western North Carolina. Yes, you can. All you got to do is go to where you normally go to give. And just change the funds to Kingdom Builders. And Kingdom Builders, you can give to Kingdom Builders all year round. Because Kingdom Builders is where we support all global and local things that need help. Yep, not just for today or to now. But in the future. Mm -hmm. So you can be a part all year round. Yep, just give to good Kingdom Builders. Give to good Kingdom Builders. <laughs>